Hey everyone and welcome back to my channel. I already know what you're thinking. Brandy, how did you get your hair so long and luscious? Okay, here's my secret tip. Okay, are you ready? I don't know if you're ready. It's not mine. Second thing that I know that's definitely on your mind, right? Mm -hmm. The fishnets and long sleeve under a band t-shirt and you're just like, Brandy, I think your inner emo kid is showing. And I'm just like, I don't know what you're talking about. For this week's Makeup in History, my cousin Leah actually suggested that I touch on the Triangle Factory fires that happened in Manhattan in 1911. This video is a little bit late because I had originally tried to shoot it and my light went out. So yes, my lighting is a little bit different. I had to kind of figure out something last minute. And also, the last bit of my footage corrupted, so love that. So yeah, I've been trying to deal with those little inconveniences. Oh well, take two, plain B. Now this story is very reminiscent of what happened with the Radium Girls. Horrible safety measures. I mean, honestly, like little to no safety measures. Here soon, I hope I'm covering a topic that isn't as heavy as this or the Radium Girls. So if you're not into kind of dark historical topics, then this probably isn't for you. And I recommend you watching one of my other videos. I don't know. Or like maybe watching some documentaries because you, you should always be learning something. At least that's my opinion. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Let's go. The Triangle Waist Company was owned by Max Blank and Isaac Harris and settled into the eighth floor of the Ash Building in Manhattan in 1901. Blank and Harris were Russian-born Jewish immigrants that came to America to create and live out their own American dream. During this period, hundreds of people, primarily young Italian and Jewish immigrants, a majority of them were women who spoke little to no English, were employed by the pair. And the shirtwaist was an incredibly popular item of clothing. It was very in demand. It was seen as a must-have item. Some of the workers that they employed were very, very young. Now, in one documentary, I heard that they could be as young as 10, but at the same time in others, I've heard that it's about 14. A lot of the girls who worked there were just teenagers. A lot of them were sending money back home to their families that they had left behind in different countries and some of them were working to provide for their families and that as well allowed their families to eat. Even though America was experiencing what they call the golden age, which is when manufacturing became more popular after the industrial revolution, there was a lot of poverty going on and very poor working regulations. Well, I mean, honestly, like little to no labor regulation. These people were working up to 12 hours a day, almost every day. Now the owners were fiercely against unionization. And this led to any worker who they heard discussing the possibility of a union being started at their company, they were fired. When the International Ladies Garment Workers Union ignited a strike Blank and Harris disregarded them completely and their demands for better working conditions. Blank and Harris were also known for their poor safety measures. Bins of discarded tissue paper patterns and extra fabric were just strewn across the factory floors. There were rows and rows of cramped sewing stations. Shirtwaists were also hanging from cables overhead. Since the owners were so paranoid about losing profit, seeing as the shirtwaist was kind of going out of style just a little bit at this point by 1911, and it was a very saturated market, that they kept one of the only exits to the building closed during work hours, and they made their workers have their bags checked every day before they left to make sure that they weren't stealing any kinds of fabric or thread or shirt waists. They were big on preventing theft. Harris and Blank also didn't keep a payroll and they were unaware of the amount of people that they had working for them at any given time. <laughs> so, great business practices. The workers were also treated pretty unfairly too. 
They were screamed at whenever they would ask to use the bathroom and for taking any other breaks besides the ones that were allotted to them. The condition of the workspace was so bad. There was little to no ventilation and in the summer, the heat was unbearable and in the winter, it left them freezing. On March 25th, 1911, either a match or a discarded cigarette, they aren't totally sure on what officially started it, but a match or a cigarette ignited a bin of tissue paper patterns and extra fabric. Quickly, panic, shock, and horror would grip Manhattan. Crowds of people were gathering to try to get down the stairs and use the elevator. Well, the elevator was able to take a few trips and save some people, but then due to the heat, it stopped working. Their only other exit besides the Green Street stairs, which is where the workers would have their bags checked at the end of the day, was the one that led to Washington Street, I believe, and it was locked and no one could find the key. So people resorted to trying to get down the fire escape, but the fire escape didn't have a ladder long enough to reach the ground. So people would try to jump from it and they died. A crowd began to gather below on the street. They watched as women began to climb on the windowsills and they saw the panic in their faces and they begged them not to jump. But one by one, they came down. At this moment, I would like to read a quote. This is a testimonial by William Shepard and it's called Eyewitness at the Triangle. I will leave the whole thing linked in the description. The first 10 thud deads shocked me. I looked up, saw that there were scores of girls at the windows. The flames from the floor below were beating in their faces. Somehow I knew that they, too, must come down, and something within me, something that I didn't know was there, steeled me. Call the firemen, they screamed, scores of them. Get a ladder, cried others. They were all as alive, whole, and sound as were we who stood on the sidewalk. I couldn't help thinking of that. We cried to them not to jump. We heard the sirens of a fire engine in the distance. The other sirens sounded from several directions. Here they come, we yelled. Don't jump. Stay there. I mean, he goes on to talk about multiple, multiple other people jumping. But this part I thought was interesting. This part was brought to life in the TV movie from the 1970s as well as it was touched on in some documentaries that I watched, quote, as I looked up, I saw a love affair in, in the midst of all the horror. A young man helped a girl to the windowsill. Then he held her out, deliberately away from the building, and let her drop. He seemed cool and calculating. He held out a second girl the same way and let her drop. Then he held out a third girl who did not resist. I noticed that. They were as unresisting as if he were helping them onto a streetcar instead of into eternity. Undoubtedly, he saw that a terrible death awaited them in the flames, and his was only a terrible chivalry. Then came love amid the flames. He brought another girl to the window. Those of us who were looking saw her put her arms around him and kiss him. And then he held her out into space and dropped her. But quick as a flash, he was on the windowsill himself. His coat fluttered upward. The air filled his trouser legs. I could see that he wore tan shoes and hose. His hat remained on his head. Thud, dead, thud, dead. Together, they went into eternity. I saw his face before they covered it. You could see in it that he was a real man. He had done his best." End quote. The firemen's ladders didn't reach all the way up, so once they arrived, it, it was just like it was no good. Some girls were jumping to try to land on the ladders, but they missed and they fell and they still died. Some of the firemen were trying to use their hoses, but their hoses didn't reach. Also, another thing that I forgot to mention, they had originally tried to put out the fire in the factory, but their hose that they had as a safety measure, safety measure, it was rusted and rotted. They couldn't get anything from it. It was useless. If you can't tell, like, this story, it gets me, man. So many things played such a huge role in this disaster. Their wooden table workstations were so large and so cramped 
that it made it really difficult for them to escape and some didn't make it. You could see them in the windows with just pure terror on their faces, basically just burning up. And there was nothing you could do but watch if you were down on the street. Oh, and did I mention all of this happened in under 30 minutes? Yeah. But not only were people jumping to try to aim at the ladders that the firemen had, they were trying to jump and be caught in these nets and it was too high. They just went right through it. And in the last quote that I will read from William Shepard's testimonial from the Triangle Factory fire is this, quote, the floods of water from the fireman's hose that ran into the gutter were actually stained red with blood. I looked upon the heap of dead bodies and I remembered these girls were the shirt waist makers. I remembered the great strike of last year in which these same girls had demanded more sanitary conditions and more safety precautions in the shops. These dead bodies were their answer. It makes me nauseous to think about it, but I highly recommend everyone go read Shepard's statement. It is intense, but if you can handle it, definitely take a look at it. It is very, very detailed about everything that he saw. From what I can tell, he saw almost the whole thing from start to finish. After the 30 minutes had passed, the fire was under control and they were able to go in and start investigating and looking for more bodies. I think that the official number of casualties was 146 men and women, almost 150 people dead in a 30 minute period. Now, obviously this sparked mass outrage. So many victims lay unclaimed at the morgue for quite some period of time. Now, according to the Cornell University website, they say that the final six victims were identified in 2011. And these people were Josephine Camarada, age 17, Dora Evans, age 18, Max Florin, age 23, Maria Giuseppe Lauletti, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and I apologize, age 33, Conchetta Pristifilippo, she was aged 22, and Fanny Rosen, she was 21. The Cornell University website has so much interesting information, including like a bunch of different witness testimonies and like original news reports about the fire. I really, really, really recommend you guys check it out if you are interested. I always like to try to dive as deep as possible as I can into these topics. That's one of the reasons why I like Stephanie Harlow's video so much that she does on true crime. Bailey Sarian does a wonderful job too. As I said, she is actually the one who inspired me to do this series. But Stephanie Harlow, she does like in-depth stuff like goes into people's parental histories whenever discussing true crime to see like what may have helped contribute so i think she says like to know how we got here we must start from the beginning or something really good time to finish off the eyes and then we'll close out the story oh crap i meant to pack shadow down there first it's not going to be perfect but i'm not really going for perfect and if you guys would like an actual tutorial on how to do this look i can give you one I mean, I know that this is kind of like a tutorial, but also like not at the same time. <laughs> I just really like to do this look whenever I'm wearing my Blink-182 shirt, because it's fun. And they're one of my all-time favorites. I'm still trying to make a conscious effort to where you guys can see me do it. Oh, poop. Screw it, let's do a wing. Ruin all my hard work. Oh no, that's actually cute, okay. Okay, now I gotta try to get these things even. Okay, that's just what I have to do. The city was so grief-stricken and angry over what happened. They held large, large funeral processions for the workers that died in the fire. Witnesses and workers that survived the fire gave their testimony to unions, and this further fueled the call for better workplace regulations. Now, after the disaster, the survivors of the fire were grief-stricken themselves. They, some of them had very severe burns. Some later died in hospital, but some organizations worked together, like the Joint Relief Committee. They teamed up with the American Red Cross and established a fund from the general public to help support 
the survivors and their families. Here comes the infuriating part, okay? Blank and Harris said that their building was, quote, fireproof and that it had just been approved by the Department of Buildings, end quote. Fireproof, really? You're gonna say it was fireproof after 150, okay, you know what? Okay. Calls for justice later came from the public and other survivors, and eventually the pair were indicted and charged with manslaughter. Now the manslaughter charge was brought since they had kept that door to, I think, Washington Street closed and locked during work hours. So the trial began in December of 1911, but by the end of the month, both Blank and Harris had been acquitted and the verdict was that they did nothing wrong. <laughs> Which to me, it's like, how could you even come to that conclusion? But I really do love this lip color. But that's not the only thing that is enraging besides the fact that they were found not guilty. Later on, they were both involved in 23 individual civil suits. They eventually decided to settle and they paid $75 per life lost. So apparently that's as much as a life adds up to, I guess. So in 1913, Blank was again charged with keeping the door locked during work hours, which was against regulation. And he was fined $20 and the judge apologized to him. But no matter how many lawsuits, no matter what information was brought to the public, it didn't really seem to matter. They were always adamant that the conditions were completely safe, fireproof, sanitary, until the end. But again, like with the Radium Girls, the aftermath of this event was huge. It led to massive reforms in fire hazard safety. This led to numerous and numerous new labor regulations and bills being adopted by New York. Now, they had a warning before all of this happened. On November 25th, 1910, exactly four months before the events at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, another factory caught fire in Newark, New Jersey. This led the New York City fire chief to issue a warning to the public that, quote, a fire as deadly as the one in Newark could happen at any time. A fire in the daytime would be accompanied by a terrible loss of life. And he was right, just four months later, exactly. And I think about 20 to 30 workers may have died in that fire. I apologize, I can't remember the exact number right now. It's what happens. You know, that's why I say, if we ignore our history, we are doomed to repeat it. And just as that happened only four months later, any loss of life is devastating. The Newark one should have been an eye opener to those people and it wasn't. In Triangle, they lost almost 150 people. Most of them very young, like teenagers. I saw a couple people on the Cornell University victims list. I think they have all of their ages listed. There were so many that were teenagers. Anna Altman, 16. Yetta Berger, 18. Essie Bernstein, 19. Morris Bernstein, 19. Ida Brodsky, 15. Rose Mel, 15. Kate Leone, 14. Rosie Grasso, 16. Jenny Stellino, 16. Bessie Viviano, 15. Rosaria Maltese, 14. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on and on and on. There's so many people. For these people, you can click on their names on the list and get information about who they were. Now, this isn't a complete database. They're still working to research the victims and get all of the information that they can to make sure that their legacy does live on. These victims should not be forgotten and I feel like the aftermath, even though they brought about some good safety regulations, like with the Radium Girls, it's just, it didn't have to happen. There's no excuse for this. For me, the Radium Girls had a little bit more of an excuse because there wasn't a whole lot known about Radium at the time. 
But these were young men and women just trying to earn a living making clothing items, making a shirt waist. You know, they weren't working with hazardous materials. They were working in hazardous conditions. There is a big difference here. Now, some of what happened with the Radium Girls could have been prevented. Yes, if they had been given more protections, but this is totally inexcusable. And it infuriates me, just like it did with the Radium Girls. I could compare the two till the cows come home, but I'm already home. <laughs> That's a joke. But yes, again, another devastating story, but it is so important that we remember these victims, celebrate their lives as short as they were, and take lessons from the tragedy. That is what I've always tried to do with anything bad that has happened in my life. I always try to find a lesson somewhere, whether it be a mistake that I made or trusting someone that I shouldn't have. It's important to try to find a lesson in everything negative. I cannot stress that enough. And if you can do that, it makes life and its tragedies a little bit more bearable. All right, Leah, I hope that you especially enjoyed the video. I worked pretty hard on it. I even refilmed it for you so you can be proud of me because I didn't want to, you know, you were begging me to look it up and I did and I was really interested in the first video. I was just like struggling and I didn't have a good script written out. So I wanted to make sure that, you know, I got all of the facts that I could. So I will be leaving resources for everybody in the description for, for like my sources and the makeup that I used for today's look and I... Hope that you like and maybe consider subscribing. Um, I try to do these every week, but sometimes they can get a little bit delayed. I am a mom and I am in college, so, you know, I, I try to balance everything as best as I can, but sometimes certain areas need more attention. So if you guys also have any suggestions for anything that you want me to talk about in the future, please leave them down below. Yeah, so plan on keeping these up and going. I really enjoy doing these and Thanks for watching. I'll see y'all later. Bye.